Hello, and welcome to the Collider Podcast. I'm Collider Senior Editor Matt Goldberg, and with me is Managing Editor Adam Chitwood. Howdy, folks. Today, we're doing our big damn Christopher Nolan podcast. <laughs> uh, Tenet opened in the U.S. this past weekend. Uh, for the past couple of weeks, I did uh, a retrospective series on all of Christopher Nolan's movies. And now Adam and I are going to talk specifically about each of those films leading up to Tenet. And then we will have a spoiler-free discussion of Tenet because Adam hasn't seen it yet, nor should he because he would have to to pay cash money to risk his life <laughs> going into the, into a, an Oklahoma theater <laughs> where freedom is more important than wearing a mask. I have very, very, I have a lot of questions for you though. Okay. That. Well, before we get to that, I mean, it's, I think just in a broad overview, I think the appeal of Christopher Nolan, like why he is sort of this beloved figure, it has nothing to do with kind of his personality. I think even though we have, we've heard some fun Nolan stories, <laughs> like in the Slack yesterday, we're talking about how his like family loves phantom thread <laughs> and how they like they call their like their kids will like mockingly call their dad call christopher nolan mr woodcock <laughs> it's a weird thing but that's delightful in its own weird way um but more than that i think his films what he offers the audience that no one else is really doing is he offers films with a blockbuster scope coupled with an intellectual vibe that the idea is that you you're not just it's not just that he's offering you spectacle, but you have to be smart to understand a Nolan film. That you have to be intellectually engaged in a way that a blockbuster film doesn't typically demand of its audience. It really wants to hit you on an intellectual level and a dramatic level. And sometimes it can be even, I think, a little cold. I think his films are can be kind of... Uh, remote, even though I wouldn't say, I, I would say that his films also do have, they have humor in them. I don't want to say they're, they're completely humorless. Um, but he, he makes sort of films with the, I don't want to say the illusion of maturity, but they're sort of, they are sort of more grown up in the way than I would say like a Zack Snyder. Like a Zack Snyder film is like being mature is being gritty and dark. Whereas like for a Christopher Nolan film is like being grown up means you took like AP English, you know, <laughs> it means like you're, you're willing to engage with the text. And so that like, when I, when I make a Batman movie, it's not just going to be a Batman film. It's going to be about the war on terror. Like it's going to have levels to it. And those levels sort of make the audience feel, um, rewarded that they engage with this kind of blockbuster. And then because that his films are such a success, he is sort of the rare filmmaker where he can go to a studio and say, I want to make something that's not based on anything except an original idea. And they'll be like, here's $200 million. And that studio is always Warner Brothers because <laughs> they just love him so much. Well, I think his films are not only thematically mature, they're uh, like narratively ambitious. So he mm, plays yeah. with conventions of storytelling. There, there's a lot of nonlinear storytelling. Um, which is not unique. You can find that in a lot of other films, but not many people are getting away with doing that with a $250 million budget. Um, and so to be able to see a, you know, massive scope sci-fi film, sci-fi action film with this really complex narrative structure that forces you to kind of think about the way that stories are told and the way that you uh, are used to stories being told in movies and and having to kind of work out like, OK, how is he telling this story? And then what makes that different? How does it apply to the themes of the film? Right. Yeah. There's usually the ambition usually has some sort of thematic connection yeah. so that, for instance, in in Memento, the film plays in reverse chronology because its protagonist has no longer can no longer. Uh, discern effect from cause because he has no short-term memory. So in order to put your mind yourself in the mind of that protagonist, you have to kind of run the film backwards. If you run it in chronological order, it doesn't have the same impact. Yeah. Um, Inception, you know, these levels. Spoiler you know, these... alert. <laughs> Getting <laughs> there. Get to Inception. We'll get to Inception. All right. So yeah, those are sort of the broad overviews of, of Christopher Nolan's filmography. But uh, let's let's jump into his feature debut, uh, Following, uh, which is currently available in the Criterion Collection. It came out in 1998, um, and it's a story. It's it's a very it's consciously low budget. Nolan knew he wouldn't have hardly any money to make it. It premiered at Slamdance, which is the sister festival to Sundance for much lower budget movies. <laughs> Uh, it has no stars. It's basically about this aspiring writer who starts following people and gets wrapped up in this 
sort of noir caper story. Um, and it's it's fascinating revisiting that film because you just look at it and you're like, oh, these are themes that Nolan like deeply cares about. Like he didn't just sort of make like a one for them. This will this will be my calling card movie. He's like, no, I'm, I'm genuinely concerned with time and identity and, and voyeurism. Um, and I think all of that really comes through in following. Yeah, it's an interesting movie. I uh, I've only seen it once um, a few years ago. And you can see kind of the shades of what he would be playing with on a larger scale later on. Um, but I think it's really handsomely crafted uh, and really solid debut, especially for the budget that he has. Um, and he's telling a really interesting story um, within that, like a thematically ambitious story, I guess I should say. And he's not it's not like, uh, you know, it came out in 1998 and throughout the 90s, you had all these filmmakers who were trying to be Quentin Tarantino uh, to varying degrees of success and budgets. Um, the Boondock Saints being one of the worst. <laughs> By the way, if you're, if, if you're interested in that, I highly recommend the documentary Overnight, which is about yes. how that director is a giant douche clown. <laughs> yes, that documentary is very good. Um, but following is interesting in that it doesn't feel like it's trying to glob onto what was popular at the moment, which were kind of Tarantino-esque films um, in kind of the, you know, throughout the 90s, really. Um, or, you know, he wasn't trying to glob onto like action or like speed or anything like that. It's really reaching back. I mean, it's black and white and it and it, it feels like it draws more in, uh, influence from like international films and like French cinema. Um, especially the way that it's kind of playing with conventions and stuff like that. So I think that immediately kind of set Nolan apart and made him, um, I think kind of people kind of perked up because it didn't feel like a lot of those other films. No, it had its own sort of tone and personality. And um, also something you, you can see from that film already is that Nolan is, it's not just he's a fan of film. And when I say film, I mean the actual, you know, celluloid but he understands how it is used. So in the commentary track, he talks about how he didn't want to shoot um, in color because the lighting would not have, would have made the film look cheaper when you, if you were to shoot on color, but if you showed it in black and white, you have a lot more control and that sort of knowledge of celluloid and how it's developed and how it looks like the last guy who will be fighting for film will probably be Christopher Nolan. Yeah. Well, when everyone else moves to digital and is just like, no, digital's easier. It gives me more control. I have, you know, I can shoot longer. I, I have all these options that I didn't have before. It's cheaper. It saves money. Christopher Nolan will still be banging away at like, no, it has to be on film. Well, and he pretty single-handedly saved film a few years ago when, uh, you know, digital photography and digital cameras were, um, you know, the way that most studios were going to the point that uh, these other, like the the film production plans were shutting down. Nolan really rallied the troops and took it upon himself to, and this is like, I think Steven Spielberg and Edgar Wright both said it was Nolan who did this, but he rallied the troops and, and essentially got the major studios in Hollywood to strike a deal with Kodak where they would say, listen, we guarantee we will buy X amount of film stock from you every year, which will thus keep Kodak in business. And so it it means that film is still alive today. Because there were a couple of years there where it felt like, you know, that choice was maybe going to disappear or going to be, uh, you know, extremely rare. Um, and now you see, you know, Spielberg, Edgar Wright are still doing it. You know, Wes Anderson, Judd Apatow, J.J. Abrams are still shooting on film. Um, but you're even seeing, uh, I mean, you and I see indies at Sundance every single year that are shot on film. And it's, you know, largely thanks to Christopher Nolan that that choice is still there. Yeah, I forget. What was the name of that Keanu Reeves documentary? Or side by Side. Side by Side. And basically the side by side is everyone is digital except Christopher Nolan. Yeah. <laughs> the side of, of film is Christopher Nolan. But it's a good documentary for like understanding that sort of divide. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, like Christopher Nolan gets it. And I think following, I mean, you know, it's weird. Following is, is such a weird film in his in his filmography because it's it's so small scale. Yeah. And he has no, shown no interest in returning to that scale. Um, maybe he will one day, but for now he has no interest in it. And I think for some people it's sort of like, oh, this is a fine first effort. But like I think it's genuinely good. Um, and I definitely think it's worth being in the Criterion collection. I think it's pretty good. I probably need to see it again. I've only seen it once, like I said. Um, it's, you know, towards the latter half of mm. his filmography for me. Sure. Um, and then his next film, his breakthrough, Memento, is one of my all-time favorite films. And I think that, to me, is where all of his kind of, even though it doesn't have the scope 
that he became known for. I think from a storytelling, like nuts and bolts level, it's just incredibly well done. It's just a sort of a masterpiece of neo-noir uh, where this protagonist, you know, he's trying to solve a mystery and the twist is sort of that his identity is is wrapped up in the mystery, that he needs the mystery to survive. And I think that the, you know, people called it back, the fact that it runs backwards um, a gimmick, but I don't think it's a gimmick at all. I think it's an essential storytelling device for the film. Uh, yeah, this movie is is one of my favorites of his as well. And it was really, I was obsessed with it when it came out. It yeah. came out in the year 2000. And it is interesting to see, like, you know, the Nolan bros. There's, there's, you know, Chris Nolan has a pretty intense fandom. But it is interesting to see kind of the generational divide because it does seem like a lot, or, or some of his fans, um, probably, like, became really into him with Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. Uh, whereas like you and I, our generation, like Memento was just this huge deal. Like you couldn't get away from it. It was, uh, especially for cinephiles, it was a film that a lot of people were super into. And I remember, I think it was nominated for the Oscar, right? For screenplay. Yeah, for, it was nominated for best original screenplay, but it lost to Gosford Park. Yeah. So I remember like really rooting for it for screenplay. screenplay. And again, like at this point in time, you know, you had movies like The Matrix that had come out. Um, but film was in, you know, you had Paul Thomas Anderson doing his thing. Um, there were a lot of different auteurs doing a lot of different things. And Memento felt, again, not like an imitation, but felt like something fully unique. I had never seen a movie like that before that played backwards. And again, it made you feel a little smart when you got it. Like it, once you were kind of going along and you're like, oh, yeah, OK, now I pick up on and understand. But it takes skill as a filmmaker for Christopher Nolan to piece together the story, not only in that way, but in a way that he has to, as a filmmaker, let you know in the film, he has to teach you the rules without mm -hmm. someone saying, here are the rules of this film. Here is how this movie works. So uh, certain visual cues like black and white and color allows you to understand like, OK, this happened right before that. And this is smashing into that. So again, it, it, I think that's a it's an underrated thing. I think it's something that um, people can kind of maybe gloss over. But it's something that that works really well in a lot of his films is, is he has to teach you the language of his film in a way that doesn't seem super obvious. Right. I would also say that he has a level of trust with his audience that is not uh, it's it's rare. I'll say that it's, yeah. you know, there's a lot of filmmakers out there who they don't reach for big ideas in a populist way because they feel like the audience is never going to get it. So they just either with the, they'll, they'll kind of go to one or two extremes, which is either they'll just dumb it down and those be like, you know what, we got to cut out all, everything that's confusing or else people will will lose interest and they we, we can't do that. Or they kind of go in the like I would call like the David Lynch direction where it becomes so heady and obtuse where like if you want it, if you really want it, you can get it. <laughs> but it's like <laughs> like for me, like I, I watch a film like Mulholland Drive and I'm just like. <laughs> you know, I don't know if I'm enjoying, like, I'm sure it makes sense on some level, but it's, it's so demanding that like, I don't know if I want to go back to the well another time. Whereas I think Nolan kind of manages that balance of just being entertaining enough while also, you know, challenging his audience, make requiring you to be an active viewer. I think that's the key is that Nolan is never making an art film. He's always making entertainment mm -hmm. and that entertainment may be gussied up and, and complex and, a little more narratively ambitious um, uh, or complicated, but it's never, he's never like, oh, I'm just going to make a really straight drama, uh, except for once, and we'll get to that next. Um, uh, but even then, it's kind of not. He he, he always kind of has his finger on, like, I am telling a story to entertain. And while entertaining, I'm going to give people their vegetables. I'm going to make something substantial. Um, but ultimately, it is going to be an enjoyable and pleasurable experience. You know, yeah, he definitely wants to to use the form of cinema to to exhilarate his audience while revisiting, like, in particular, the themes about time and truth that sort of permeate almost his his entire filmography. I am sad that he hasn't worked with Guy Pierce again, because I think Guy Pierce is really phenomenal. In yes, so I agree. No, I, I think they're going to come back. Yeah, I, I it's it's interesting because Nolan is a is a director that likes re like working likes working with the same people again and again. I mean, I, but only I think, from Batman begins on because he hasn't brought anyone back from those other. Films. That's true. Yes. From Batman begins on, but I will say like, if I would be surprised if I guess the only one without Michael Caine is Dunkirk. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
And oh, I think he might have like a voice cameo in that or something. Maybe. Yeah, sure. probably. He, he loves Michael Caine. And I, I would say, don't we all? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so after, after Memento is kind of a breakthrough film for Nolan, uh, the studios come calling and he eventually s- signs up with Warner Brothers to remake a Norwegian film called Insomnia. And uh, man, Insomnia... What, when was the last time you saw Insomnia? <laughs> so whenever, so I have a ranking of Christopher Nolan's films on Collider right now that I, I kind of revisit and update with every new film. Um, but whenever I first posted that was the last time I saw Insomnia. So it was probably within the last four years or so, um, maybe three years. And it's fine. I mean, again, at the time, I was super into it. So at the time, I was really obsessed with Robin Williams. Uh, and I was really obsessed with Robin Williams as a dramatic performer. Mm-hmm. So I think that this was after One Hour Photo, right? This might have been the same year as One Hour Photo. Okay, so I was really intrigued by that one-two punch, and so I was really into Insomnia uh, in that regard. So when I first saw it, I was a teenager, um, and I was like, "Oh, I really like this." But I don't. I think even then, I there was still something about it that I didn't love. Um, It's just kind of fine. And even Nolan admits, like he said, the reason he took the film was to prove that he could handle a studio budget. He wasn't super passionate about the material. It wasn't like this is the kind of movies I want to make. It was. OK, let me apply my skills as a filmmaker to a larger budget. So let me do some chase sequences. Um, let me work with a lot of exteriors. Let me work with, you know, a bunch of A-list actors and to prove that he could do it. And that's why he never turned back. Like after Insomnia, he's never made a movie that small again. And Insomnia is not small compared to Memento, um, but it still at the time was for him. And I think it's fine. I mean, it, it owes a lot to those. Uh, I was listening to the Roger Deakins podcast recently and and Roger and his wife, James, were talking about um, how much they love like Scandinavian crime series and stuff like that and how the American remakes are always terrible because <laughs> um, the insomnia feels like the killing a little bit and the killing itself is based on a, a Scandinavian series, I think. Um, there's something lacking there. There's something lacking in insomnia and I can't quite put my finger on it. I think what's lacking is especially like the... The Norwegian original has a very clear idea of what it wants to be about, which is that essentially our actions are meaningless. And if, if our actions if our actions uh, have no repercussions, if there are no consequences for doing evil, then what is the point of being moral? Uh, which is some really bleak <laughs> shit. That's, That's some really un-American. I know, <laughs> right? And so like, the fact that like a studio is like, oh, let's make this is just, it's kind of weird. It's like they're just, they just saw like a cop and, and killer like movie and they're like, Oh, let's make that. And like, they they completely miss what it's about. Um, and Nolan to his credit tries to make it a little bit more like, you know, what do I care? I care a lot about people who lie and the, and the whole film is based around two lies. Um, but it feels like he's kind of struggling to make it, to leave his imprint on it. And, and the film is forcing itself against him. So it, it kind of makes like, it's an all right Christopher Nolan movie, but it's not a really good remake. Uh, even though I think Robin Williams is actually very good in it. It made me yeah. like miss Robin Williams, like rewatching it. I was like, man, Robin Williams is so good at drama, you know, like just really could like get under your skin in a really fascinating way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those scenes between him and Pacino are, are a little few and far between, but when they come, they're really, really delightful to they're they're actually not that few a lot of that movie is just the two of them talking on the phone <laughs> well i meant like face to face oh yeah yeah basically yeah. interacting yes um so yeah i i you know insomnia is not like you should it's underrated no it's it's rated accurately yeah <laughs> but it's fine. it's fine um and then so then uh he decides to go nolan decides to go reinvent the superhero film <laughs> which is still a pretty young kind of resurgence at this point. Like it's picked back up with Blade and X-Men and Spider-Man, but it's sort of, it hasn't been fully defined yet. And then he kind of says, what if we try to treat Batman, who is the most popular superhero as a realist, in a realistic framework. And I think that that sort of was a game changer, not just for superhero films, but also for just action movies in general for franchises in general like we've talked about this like it became shorthand to be like a thriller you know an origin story in the remake in the vein of batman begins yeah it became just a shorthand a gritty reboot yes and so and i think batman begins is a film i like for the most part i think the wheels come off in the third act and i've always i've always said that (laughs) but um it's it's i would say it's a it's a pretty good batman movie it's hard to I don't know. I I think the Dark Knight is a better Batman movie. I think Batman Begins has flaws, 
But it's also really easy to forget how monumental that film was, because I remember seeing it for the first time. And I, you know, as a kid, really liked Batman Returns, was obsessed with Batman Forever, obviously, soundtrack, Jim Carrey. And this was just so radical and so different. It really blew me away. And it was one of the the earliest movies, not earliest, but it was a movie that I remember seeing many, many times in a theater. Like going back, I was like, I wanted to take my dad. I wanted to take my friends. I wanted to take my friends who hadn't seen it because it just felt so fresh and different. I was I was living in New York at the time. And I remember going to see a midnight screening of Batman Begins out on like 14th Street. And like the movie got out and I immediately called like one of my best friends and just like raved to him. Like, and it, even though it was like early in the morning, like I knew he'd be up and I was just like raving on this like yeah. street corner in New York <laughs> in the middle of the night being, oh my God, this new Batman movie is so good. And it, you know, again, like its flaws become more apparent on repeat viewings. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think it was doing something so different that you couldn't help but kind of like respect what it was accomplishing. Yeah, I interviewed Nolan's longtime production designer, Nathan Crowley, uh, on an episode of Collider Connected, which you can watch right now on YouTube. Um, he's a delightful human being. Um, but he talked about Batman Begins and how Christopher's thing was he wanted to explain everything, like an answer for everything. So, like, why does the suit have ears? You know, what is the Batmobile? Like, how does it actually run? How do all of these things work? And again, that was radical because we had had. You know, X-Men opens, uh, you know, in a concentration camp and Sam Raimi's Spider-Man was was radically different from other superhero movies that had come before. But not all of them still took leaps of logic and and kind of like you had to believe and kind of, you know, things like, that yeah, Peter exist. Parker gets his suit. How yeah. does he get it? I don't know. He just gets it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he re, he draws he just, some sketches. And, and then, and then all of a sudden he has a suit. <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing. And, you know, whatever. And X-Men, obviously, you know, mutants powers that doesn't exist. But Batman Begins, he wanted everything to have an answer. So it is it is it's extremely realist and grounded, but it, it also has a it has more theatricality than the other two Batman movies, I would say. Like, especially it, in the creation of of like the narrows and stuff, yes, it feels theatrical. Well, it feels sort of of a piece with what Tim Burton and Joel Schumacher had attempted, which yeah. is that they want to make Gotham feel fantastical. That it's sort of a, a world detached from our own. And then in Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rise, he's like, no, it's just it's Chicago and then it's, Philly, <laughs> and then it's Pittsburgh. <laughs> you know, he, then he doesn't care. But by, but in Batman Begins, like Gotham has its own personality. Yeah. Yes. It's, yeah, for sure. Yeah. A lot of the use of the color brown. <laughs> yeah, that, and yes. and in my interview, he Nathan Crowley talked about that, he, and he said he doesn't think it was true for Chris, but for him, The Dark Knight was the Batman movie he had always wanted to make because they could really dig into like a modernist, uh, um, you know, mid-century architecture and really use Chicago, which, as you said, like the Tim Burton and Joel Schumacher was more kind of like gothic and theatrical. Yeah, Tim Burton was gothic, and then Joel Schumacher was was candy colored, and yeah, you know, yeah. it's. <laughs> Neon um, everywhere. Neon everywhere. Suits the glow got lights. Nipples. Remember the glow light fight sequence, where everyone had I, the glow paint on them. Yeah, Robin beating up people. I think that was Batman and Robin, or was that Batman Forever? I can't remember. <laughs> They're so <laughs> <laughs> They're wild uh, movies. Yeah. Um. So yeah, Batman Begins was a very big swing, and and but it sort of changed things. And then what was surprising is, is that instead of being like, oh, I have to do the sequel right now, because Batman Begins, I mean, it was a modest hit. It wasn't it didn't it wasn't like doing it didn't do like Spider-Man two numbers, which was sort of like the big one at the time. Yeah, um, but it, it did respectably, but it it didn't do enough to be like Warner Brothers, like you need to get your ass back here and make a sequel right fucking now. So there the was also fatigue because it was again like everyone thought Batman was Batman forever and this kind of theatrical thing. So it, a lot of it was word of mouth, I think, mm -hmm. like in yeah. my recollection was like people didn't go see it when it first came out. I think it definitely benefited from the DVD boom. Yeah. Just, you know, people having time to catch up with it. And in the meantime, Christopher Nolan goes and makes The Prestige. Yeah. Um, which is really kind of, like, I, I think Inception is his masterpiece, but I think if you really want to understand Nolan, you kind of got to look at The Prestige, yeah. which is, for, for both its strengths and its faults, I think there are elements of it where Nolan doesn't realize how funny the concept is. Like, he takes it deadly serious that... There are these two dueling magicians, which is just kind of campy and funny when you think about it. He's like, no, 
they're magicians and they and they're just sort of they hate each other but this notion of like the the structure of the trick and the desire for the audience to be fooled is sort of just Nolan's MO. Like that's sort of what he believes. He believes in sort of the power of the benevolent lie, which is to say that everybody lies. As a storyteller, I am a liar. I am lying to you. I am deceiving you. But you want that deception because it reveals, it has the potential to reveal a truth. Yeah. Yeah, The Prestige is one of my favorite films of his. I think, I think that on a craft level, it's gorgeous. I love the mm. recreation um, that they put together there. But I also think, I, I don't know, I just really like the the thematic notion of like, what does success cost? Like, you know, is it, and is it worth the cost? You have these two dueling magicians and they're both striving for greatness and one of them achieves it, um, but he achieves it at the cost of his life. Like his life is built entirely on this lie. And upon, you know, switching his lives. And then the other one also <laughs> gives up his life in different ways. Uh, Hugh Jackman's character. Um, so, uh, you know, and ultimately, like, is it worth it? Like, is it is is wowing the audience is um, pulling off something truly great? Is it worth that cost? Right. Yeah. What is the cost of storytelling? What is mm-hmm. it? What does it demand? What is the fidelity to it? And it's where it's interesting because I think that there's a way that you can pose both characters as oddly heroic and how much they're willing to sacrifice, but they're just such giant dicks. Yeah. They're just horrible people, but it's sort of like, you're still kind of enraptured of what they're doing um, and sort of following along with, you know, the sacrifices they're making and, and, and the need to sort of destroy the other. It's not just yeah. that they can just live their lives. They have to destroy the other person in some way. What's well, this competition? I think it has a little bit in common of there will be blood. Um, mm-hmm. But I would also say, I mean, Nolan doesn't have a ton of female characters in his films or a ton of uh, memorable female characters. But I do think the female characters in The Prestige are, and and I don't say this lightly, I think they're used very well um, to demonstrate the cost of, uh, and, you know, the dickishness frankly of these two characters you watch you watch what it does to scarlett johansson and rebecca hall's characters you watch and again that that devoting your entire life to this thing you could call it your work Mm -hmm. um at the cost of your relationships at the cost of love at the cost of family and that's fascinating to me because i think something we haven't really talked about we haven't talked about it is that nolan's producing partner is his wife emma yeah. thomas mm-hmm. and she is just a vital part of all of his work and yet yeah. women are not really i mean it's sort of become a running joke about dead wives being a recurring theme in yeah. nolan's movies and it's not that i think that his films are loveless but i think he does struggle i mean he's never had a female protagonist in his movies to date um, and I think he does sort of struggle with the feminine perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I think it gets, uh, I honestly think interstellar is one of the more interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll, we'll debate that later. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but inception like mall is a construct of Cobb's mind. So she's not actually mall. Um, and I think, I think Catwoman is up there. Catwoman's fun. Catwoman is is fun. And I mean, you know, again, when we get to Interstellar, we can talk about Murph. Um, but again, it's 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 interesting to me because I agree with like with I think the char- the the the, char- the female characters in the procedure are used fairly well, but at the same time, well, I think Rebecca Hall's character is used pretty well. I feel like Scarlett Johansson is wasted a bit. I feel like she's just kind of a pawn knocked between well and that's what i that's what i mean is is they're not they're They're not not super complicated characters Mm -hmm. and they don't really have interior lives but they are used to prove the further point of the cost that these men the the cost of of greatness i guess um that these men forego uh you know in terms of their relationships right what they do to they could potentially have love and happiness but they want the greatness right and the greatness for who and who does it serve? And serves you know, the audience. Yeah. And what yes. is your life? And then is it worth it? Like, what is your life like? What is your quality of life? You yeah. know, Christian Bale's character and Christian Bale's performance or performances in this film, I think, are are really tremendous. I think Hugh Jackman's very good too. I think Hugh yeah. Jackman is. It's funny, like he's such a charming guy, but I think he does dickishness very well. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, I think the Prestige is just—it's a film that, again, if you really want to get 
tuned into Nolan's wavelength, you gotta you have to watch The Prestige. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then you get to The Dark Knight, which kind of changes everything. Um, <laughs> so I would say for the worst, because I think too many films just looked at The Dark Knight and like, oh, we want, we need, oh, our superhero movies need to be gritty now. Gritty and, not- and a super duper like intense villain who overshadows the the hero. Yeah, that's the thing. When you, by the time you get to The Dark Knight, I think The Dark Knight is a really good crime thriller. I think it's kind of just an okay Batman movie. I think Batman is a little bit of an afterthought in the film. Um, I certainly, don't. <laughs> you don't. Uh, no, it's my favorite of his. I, I, don't I think it's. I think it's. A, I think it's. It's one of my favorite Nolan movies. But I think if you're like as a Batman film. Batman is sort of, I think, I don't think the conflict encompasses him as much as it does between Gordon, Dent, and the Joker. I think those are the yeah. characters that intrigue Nolan more. And then it's like, well, how do I work Batman into this? And Batman's there. I mean, he's, but I, I've, I've always maintained if you take away the Hong Kong sequence, Batman might be in the movie less than Joker. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I'm just saying I don't really care. <laughs> I know I, you don't care. I'm I just like saying, it, like, so. it depends on how you judge the film. Like, if you don't care that much about Batman. But, like, I would say as a crime thriller about the war on terror, I think it's pretty phenomenal. I think, yeah. and I think it, I think it also gets to the, again, gets to the heart of what Nolan believes about truth, which is that to, to quote, um, you know, you know, bat, so, to quote Batman, sometimes the truth isn't good enough. Sometimes people deserve something more. And it's, it is an upending of what we believe, you know, societies are built on, are conceivably built on truth. If we were all lying to each other, there could never be any cooperation. And then what Nolan says is that actually sometimes we need lie to, to agree upon a lie yeah. and agree that the lie, because the truth is, is not good enough that people can't handle that truth, whether you believe that or not. I, I think in a way, Dark Knight kind of exposes the the fascism of the lie because you're like, oh, the like because at the end of the film, they're like, oh, the people of Gotham can't handle it. And I'm like, they just proved they didn't blow each other up. There was a whole <laughs> boat experiment. And they're like, no, 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 no. If they learn that Harvey Dent is a bad guy, their hope will die. And I don't know if I've ever been able to cross that bridge. Like, I get that in the world of the film, like you have to believe that the that Gotham will fall into chaos if their white knight turns out to be a bad guy. I'm a little more like, yeah, a politician turned out to be shitty. <laughs> Isn't going to shake the foundations of Gotham. But I get what at least Nolan's going for there. And I don't think you necessarily have to agree with it. I don't think you even necessarily have to read it as an uplifting ending. It can end oh, like... No, no, I don't. I mean, uh, Edgar Wright, you know, maintains that Hot Fuzz doesn't end happily. Like, it ends in fascism. Fascism mm-hmm. is, is what wins out at the end of Hot Fuzz. And just because, you, you know, these are the characters you follow the whole time and you like them doesn't mean that what they're doing is wrong um, or isn't wrong. I don't know what I said. Uh, but yeah, I think, you know, The Dark Knight has a really tragic ending. But I just think even just from a craft perspective, I really love the score in that film and I love how it all comes together in the third act. Um, I don't like the boat thing. I will confess, I get a little fatigued as you get to the third act because it's just yeah. so much. It's a lot. But, the showdown between Gordon and Harvey and Batman, I think, is really tremendous with the score coming in. It's really emotional. Um, you're really like all of the groundwork that the film has done up until that point makes you care about every single character in that in that standoff yeah. right there. No, that like, no, I mean, the character work is outstanding. I mean, mm-hmm. it really hits everyone where they need to be. And I mean, I don't feel <clears throat> I don't really feel like there's a character wasted in no. that film. Um, it does every, make me wish that Maggie Gyllenhaal had been in Batman Begins, though, because I think she's a much better Rachel. Than yes, I, it definitely makes me sort of feel like that Katie Holmes was forced on Nolan for Batman Begins, and then he had the clout when Dark Knight came along and said, no, I want Maggie Gyllenhaal. Katie apparently said no. She apparently refused to, didn't didn't want to come back. But that was during the lost years where she was with a certain someone. And who will go nameless? Who could it be? Who could it be? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it, in any event, like I, I, yeah, I think Mag and Jillian Hall is a lot stronger. And I think the Rachel character is written stronger as well. Yeah. Um, that being said, I mean, if we, to go back to Batman Begins, I still just crack up every time, you know, Rachel is dying from the fear serum and a man in a bat costume is screaming at her. <laughs> Rachel, Rachel. <laughs> She's like, oh, <laughs> oh this will help. <laughs> so... <laughs> But yeah, I, I mean, of course, there's the Heath Ledger of, of it all with, with the yeah. Dark Knight. And it just, I, I can't get enough of that performance. It's so, it's so perfect. I can't, I, I, I think about it on a consistent basis. 
Um, I just think it's phenomenal. I, I, I would watch just those scenes happily. Yeah. It makes me mad every time that interrogation sequence. I'm always every time it hits that interrogation sequence between Joker and Batman. I'm always watching it like I'm trying to unlock something mm. like I'm trying to figure something out because I know in my head that these are actors, these are performers, but it doesn't feel like it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. This feels like a a human being that is doing this. Like I cannot I cannot reconcile the fact that, that is Heath Ledger. And that's yeah. It. I mean, the scene that gets me is the, their final confrontation where he has joker upside down and just it feels so in a weird way it's it, it's such a mix of emotions because the bad guy has been defeated and yet you kind of want him to win because yeah. he's doing giving such a good performance and i love the way that that they turn the camera yeah yeah upside down so that he's now right side up and but swing oh i love it yeah wally uh, fister his cinematography with nolan i think is really terrific uh he started working with nolan on insomnia i think and shot all the way up through Dark Knight Rises. That was his last film with him. Yeah. Um, and he's a, a not an unsung hero, but I think a, a really vital part of Nolan really fleshing out his visual language and, and fleshing out yeah. uh, what his movies yeah. look like. Yeah, oh, to go back to like what Nolan is saying about his understanding of film, I don't think Nolan would work with a cinematographer who didn't have the same understanding of no. the way film works. And uh, sort of, the, I, I mean, Nolan is right up to the line of he could be probably be his own cinematographer. Yeah. But he entrusts it to to people that know their shit. He could pull a Paul Thomas Anderson or a Steven Soderbergh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and then so after that, uh, again, I, so my <laughs> instead of now, now after Dark Knight, they're like, yes, please make us another Batman film. And, and Nolan Wise is like, no, I want to make this movie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, um, a heist inside the mind. Like yeah. what? <laughs> I remember I was on this, uh, I was on my birthright trip to Israel and I was like trying to like tell someone like, oh, it's so great that we got Inception. And the guy was like, no, 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 I just want another Batman film. And that to this day, I'm like, that's a weird position when you get a movie as good as Inception, which I think finally, which I think is the culmination of all of Nolan's sort of psychoses and themes and ideas. Like it all comes together in Inception, which is how do we entertain the audience? It's a, it's a simple heist film. It really is like a heist film. It lays everything out. It's exposition heavy, but it has that pop that keeps you moving through the story. But it deals with time and it deals with identity and it deals with truth and the lies we tell ourselves. And if you can have a benevolent, you know, lie. Um, and I just think it all comes together beautifully in Inception. Like to me, that is his best movie. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but I, I feel like You're I read wrong. somewhere. OK, <laughs> I'm wrong. All right. Um, I feel like I read somewhere that Nolan's original script, Maul was his partner. And when Leonardo DiCaprio signed on, he he would only sign on if they could do some work on the script. And it was Leonardo DiCaprio's suggestion to make Maul his wife mm. um, to add some kind of emotional uh, thing there, uh, a greater level of emotional resonance um, between the character. And that that's really uh, I mean, thematically, I think the movie is fascinating. <laughs> What's well, so funny? <laughs> You know what? You know what really gets hung up on Leonardo DiCaprio when you're when you don't stay with a woman. <laughs> That's <laughs> for those who are just listening to the podcast. Out of just activated his squinting DiCaprio background. Uh, but I think it was smart. I mean, you look at um, you, you look at the film and you think if that was his partner, I think it it's yeah. more it's more emotional if it's it his is. wife. And to me, I mean, I think the film is thematically really interesting and satisfying. And I think you're right that it's dealing with um, these issues of lies and truths and the lies we tell ourselves um, and how we kind of lock those away and try not to think about them. But uh, emotionally, it just gets me on a level that I, I only one other Nolan film gets me on. Um, and, you know, once it it's again, it's that combination of the the score with uh the performances with how nolan is shooting it but you know when maul finally jumps out that window which is really devastating it's a really yes. devastating scene it's a really emotionally captivating scene and i think leonardo DiCaprio's performance throughout the whole film is 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 really tremendous no i think the, i think the whole cast comes together perfectly like there's not a weak link among them <laughs> um also, I would like to say one of my one of the things I do really like about Nolan is how he like pulls 80s actors who haven't been in a big film in a long time. He's yeah. like, get Rutger Hauer in here, get Eric Roberts in here, yeah. get Tom Berenger in here. <laughs> like and just like to give him a key supporting role. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I think that's kind of fun. <laughs> it is fun. It's fun. I, I, you know, Inception's a fun movie. I think visually 
the Joseph Gordon Levitt stuff, like I when I first saw it for the first time, I was like, I have no idea how they did this. Absolutely no idea. And I, no, I, obviously now I've seen how they shot it, but it's it takes imagination and, and ambition to do that. Yeah, it's dazzling and it's it's smart. And I think, you know, it it really I think Inception again, there it's weird it's kind of the rap that certain Nolan movies get, like you know, oh, Memento is a gimmick and oh, Inception is confusing. And I just don't get it. Like Inception is not a confusing film. I've never been confused by Inception. Not no. not from first screening. Like it's very clear what's happening. And even you're like, well, does the top topple over? Like we can discuss like the ambiguity of that. But the ambiguity is kind of the point. The point is that it doesn't matter if the top topples over at the end because Cobb has accepted that he's with his family, regardless yep. if it's true or not. Yeah. And um I think going back to what I was saying about Memento is is Nolan is using visual language to teach you the rules of yes. the thing. And this movie, more than any other, has a lot of exposition in it. You have Joseph Gordon, like Ariadne is literally there to be an audience surrogate so yes. that people can explain to her how Inception works, how this dream logic works, how the building of levels works. Um, and then even if you didn't understand then, like once they get into the first dream level and once um, the guy is putting them to sleep in the van, he's explaining like, all right, so this level will be this, this level will be this. Um, and then just the cross cutting between, you know, the van slowly going over the cliff and how he's building. I think Lee Smith is someone we haven't talked about, who's his longtime editor, mm -hmm. um, but just building that that finale that crescendos. And so you understand all of these things are happening at the same time, but at different speeds. Yes. No, it, it all works together really well. Um, but again, it never sort of loses the emotional stakes. Yeah. Which I really, really respect. Um, so yeah, I think Inception's the best of Nolan's movies, um, which is kind of followed by one of his weakest movies, which yeah. is The Dark Knight Rises. You know, I maybe I have some saltiness attached to The Dark Knight Rises because that was like when I, I mean, when I start, I started at Collider in 2007, and like, yeah, we were tracking The Dark Knight, obviously, but like, I remember like our coverage went into freaking overdrive on the dark Knight yeah. rises like every piece of casting and speculation and what's the plot about and you know, i mean the film is itself is just kind of a wet fart it's just it doesn't matter like it's so much of that film doesn't matter it's so overly complicated like it's trying to be an adaptation of this comics of this arc in the batman comics called no man's land but it doesn't really work I, I don't buy this notion that like Bane as populist demagogue who is also terrorist, like who is also holding the city hostage, but giving it back to the people, but can blow the people up at any time. Like it doesn't, it doesn't cohere. Some have argued that the film is intentionally campy. I struggle to buy that argument. No. I, I, That's I not get, Christopher Nolan. Have you seen Christopher Nolan's movie? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it can't be in the sense that like he's making an intentional homage to the Adam West Batman, right down to Batman fleeing the city with a bomb. With a bomb. Yeah. But even then, I feel like, yes, if you were to surgically remove all the joy from the Adam West Batman, it would kind of look like this. But even then, like, it doesn't really, like, like so what? So what if you did that? Like, it doesn't, it feels like a kind of a mishmash of ideas, like 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 Occupy Wall Street was kind of happening around that point. So you have this whole like robbing Wall Street set piece, but like to what end? And yeah. they're like, Catwoman's like, we're gonna you know eat the rich, but to what end? Like, what are you actually saying? Is Batman about giving Gotham to the people? Like, what what does this all add up to? Yeah. And I think Nolan kind of gave the game away when he was like, I remember in the lead up, he was talking about how. The Joker is a mental e equal to Batman. And so, but Bane is a physical equal to Batman. And so we like if if Dark Knight is meant to check test the mental fortitude of Batman, then Bane is meant to test the physical fortitude of Batman. That's not as interesting. It's just not as interesting to test the physical limits of Batman. Um when there, especially when there's no payoff. It's not like Batman has to like break his body to save Gotham. It's just he gets broke. He gets broken. He gets dumped in a hole. He does some more push-ups, and then he leaves the hole and comes back to Gotham. I think the movie is really good until it's not. 
I really enjoy the first 45 minutes to an hour of it. I think it's a, it's a really Ooh, good tease. Do you <laughs> enjoy the first 45 minutes? Well, I, re- I really love uh, the kind of disheveled and older and injured Batman. I like mm-hmm. the I like the stuff with Catwoman in the beginning of the film. Um, I like Bane as like this masked menace who you don't know what he's doing. As soon as he takes over the city, it loses all the steam for me because I'm like, how does this work? And like... Should you just leave people under like under rocks for three months, like three months. That's a long time. And you're telling me like no one could get in there and do anything. But even beyond that, it's just not really interesting to me. Like, And then you don't know the villain's motivation. And he's not as charismatic or as interesting as the Joker to where you don't really need to know his motivation other than like he just causes chaos. So I don't really know what Bane is doing until the very end. And it's like, oh, surprise, it's really Talia al Ghul, which we all predicted from the beginning. And so you get you get motivation for the plot in like the last seven minutes of the movie. And you're like, OK. Yeah, I also feel that it replaces one fascism with another. Like if there's the fascism of Gordon and Batman's lie being exposed, which also is a plot point that plays horribly it's like God, that Bane's like I have a letter I will read my letter now and everyone's like I guess Gordon wrote it Bane said so <laughs> yeah. and then we just believe this we just event. believe that it's that it's that it's real but then it's like Gotham will fall into chaos if all the cops are off the streets <laughs> and the only way to restore order is to bring all the cops back and then Matthew yeah. Modine can die heroically you know it just I, I don't think it works on any level I really I think like there are pops of color like Tom Hardy's performance and Anne Hathaway's performance, but I I don't think any notion in the film really works. Even this notion that Batman as this egalitarian figure, like anyone can be Batman. It's like, no, no, not everyone could be Batman. That's a fundamental misunderstanding of your character. Like there are, char- there are superheroes that that works for. Like Spider-Man, like, yeah, anyone could be Spider-Man because just, it's a guy, it's a person that gets bit by a spider. That's it. That's all you need to be Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. But Batman, there was a whole movie called Batman Begins that you made that said he has to go into the middle of fucking nowhere to train with ninjas to be Batman. So this notion that like... And be rich. And, and be rich. rich. I mean, and the, the thing is, is the more that you shine a light on who is Batman, the less believable Batman becomes because you have this guy in his own little plane. Just It's like, who could that be? Maybe it's the richest person in town. Like, like it's not just some Joe Schmo who came across a bat plane. Yeah. So I don't know. I have a lot of issues with Dark Knight. And it's also like three hours long. So. Too long. It, it, like I rewatched it pretty recently within the last few weeks. And I was like, oh, this is better than I remembered. And then I was like, oh, this is worse than I remembered. So like there were parts of it that I think worked really well. As I said, I think Anne Hathaway's Catwoman is really great. Um, I think Ben Mendelsohn is kind of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but then other stuff like I don't think the Blake character works very well. Like, why is he there? He doesn't really He's serve. just plot lubricant. Like he goes yeah. around. Like he does, he says a thing and then he learns something and then he talks to someone else. And like, yeah. it's, and it's taking, the thing is, you're also taking your big characters off the board. Like Batman's yeah. in a hole, Garden's in the hospital. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, like it's one thing that I get, like you were saying, like these characters are injured and damaged, but like, you're not doing anything with that damage. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Gordon's in the hospital and then he gets better. All right. So, um, and then I think after, and then after Dark Knight Rises, you get what I think is, is Nolan's most emotional film. As as far as Nolan does emotion, which is Interstellar, and I, I really, you know, Interstellar is a film that works better for me. On like it's the it uh, as I was going through this, it was it was the lone film that was like this is better than I remember. You know, and I've liked it better every time I've seen it. It really like there it still makes some a couple missteps. I think it's a little too obvious at points. I think naming Matt Damon's character Doctor Man is is a yeah. little dumb, um, but I, I think for the most part I'm really in awe of its scope. I think it really does have a very, I think it's incredibly earnest, this notion that, you know, our future lies in the stars and exploration. Like, I think it's a very hopeful, uplifting film, but I think it's also very loving and and, and emotional because it's all about what parents give to their children. Yeah. Um, and I, I just, I'm, 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 I'm very moved by um, Interstellar, even at times when I think it kind of trips over its it's explanations. I think the, the the desire to explain love as its own force, as a scientific force, removes the the drama from it. Yeah, that's a that's a minor qualm from me, but uh, I agree with you. I think it's his most emotional film. I think it's most his most emotionally involving film. I think casting Matthew McConaughey really helps with that. I mean, mm-hmm. the scene where where he's driving away, um, 
just like destroys me. Yeah. And a lot of that is to do with McConaughey's performance, but also Nolan's decision to just keep the camera on his face and to not really cut away to anything else. Uh, I think it's, I think this is possibly Hans Zimmer's best score he's ever done. It's I amazing. really love, I really love the church organs, um, which again, like lead to this like epic scope that, you know, something bigger than us, something larger than us out there. Um, I love, uh, you know, he's playing with time, but I really liked how he dealt with it. Like where he, they went onto that planet again, the cost, like the cost of, of this thing that he's giving to his children, um, you know, the cost of giving planet earth more life. I do think it like the, the plot gets a little too complicated. Like I don't necessarily think you'd need Dr. Man in there. Um, I think that excursion is a, is a little bit of a detour, and my big problem with the film is that it, the entire driving force is he wants to get back to his daughter, and he does and spends five minutes with her and then leaves. <laughs> Nor does he ever ask what happened to his son. Like, even <laughs> yeah. if his son is dead already, does not seem particularly interested in what happened to his son. Yeah, which I think is just a really major misstep because I, I was super emotionally involved in this film. And then, you know, they have this coming together and that scene also really gutted me. And then he's like, you have your own family now. I'm going to go find Anne Hathaway. It's like, OK. Yeah, it's huh. I mean, it's tough. That's I think choice. I think the choice should have just been like, no, it's she doesn't need to see me or she's already passed. Off. Like the idea yeah. is that the whole centerpiece of the film is that your 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 purpose as a parent is to give a future to your children. It's not yeah. to be reunited with them. And I feel that, that reunification is kind of a reward that the film doesn't need. Like, yeah. oh, Coop made it back. So he gets to have. He gets to to spend five minutes with his daughter. And it just, it doesn't, I think you need to have the sort of somberness of being like, he never saw his kids again, but it's okay because they got to live. Yeah. Like that as a parent, like you would sacrifice your, you would sacrifice everything, including your own happiness and your relationship with your children. If it meant they got to have a future. Cause that's really what the, to me, the film is about. Yeah. And it's trying to have that emotional reunion while also ending on an uplifting note of like they they did it. They found a planet like Earth, like humanity will be saved. And, right. you know, he's going to reap his rewards for his sacrifice for, um, you know, everything that he's done. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, again, I, I said uh, when I first saw it, that really bugged me. And I think that really stuck in my craw a little bit and kind of overshadowed the rest of the film. But I've seen it three or four times now. And each time I revisit it, I like it a lot more. Yeah, I think it's it really does sort of wrap you up in the in the journey. I think yeah. it, as far as a film that like Nolan trying to echo 2001, but putting his own stamp on it, I think he he did that pretty well. Yeah, for sure. Um, and then after that, you move to Dunkirk, which is very different. I mean, Dunkirk is. It, I mean, our mem my mem one of my main memories of Dunkirk is always going to be like every time we wrote about Dunkirk and Warner Brothers being like, "Don't call it a war drama, call it a war thriller." <laughs> just being yeah. like, "Come on, man, <laughs> <laughs> just give me a break here." Um, but it's no. I mean, it is. It's. I think it's like Nolan's shortest movie. Yeah. No, following it's his shortest movie, but it's 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 short. I mean, his movies usually run pretty long, and it's like under two hours, and it's all just this crucible of trying to get these soldiers off the beach. And using time as kind of a way to, again, time functions similarly in um, uh, Interstellar, Dunkirk, and Tenet, and that it becomes this force that works against people. Whereas in previous movies, it's something that can kind of be construed and played with. Uh, time becomes sort of an antagonist. Um, and especially in Dunkirk, where you're just like, if, if they don't get off the beach, they're going to die. I love Dunkirk. Um, and I love that it is wildly different from anything he's ever, he, he's ever done before. I think he originally wanted to do it without a script at all um, and with no dialogue because it is, to me, a purely experiential yes. film. It is a film that is not necessarily meant for you to watch on streaming or watch while your phone's there. It's a film meant for you to see in an IMAX theater with all the lights out and you were just staring at the screen. Um, because the characters themselves honestly don't matter. You don't need to know any backstory because he is putting you in the shoes of these people putting you into the shoes of multiple people. And so you're experiencing multiple different points of view. So um, by land, by air, by sea, by air, uh, you know, Tom Hardy is just a really confident and um, gifted pilot who's willing to sacrifice. By land, it's this young boy who doesn't know war. He doesn't know what he's doing, um, is really out of its depth. 
by sea is, you know, emotionally devastating Mark Rylance, this man who has lived a life and who, uh, you know, is doing what little he can with the life that he has left um, and the ability that he has left to um, do his part. And I think some of the power is lost on us as Americans, because I know Dunkirk is a much far bigger deal um, in the UK uh, as this historical event. And I think it's a it's a tribute to those to the lives lost and the lives saved throughout that event. But I don't know. I really like the idea that Nolan is using everything he's learned from a craft perspective Mm -hmm. um, and applying it to this idea that I am making a movie that you're supposed to disappear into, not to like fall in love with these characters, but to feel as if you are doing this. Yeah, it. I think to me, on this most recent rewatch of Dunkirk, which is only my second time seeing it, because it's it is a very intense film. It really does yeah. like fray your nerves to sort of be in that crucible, especially when you see it on the big screen, like when there's no escape. And the score um, is just a ticking clock. <laughs> like, yeah, pretty much. Um, I feel like the film is all about. It gets back to the the element of truth in Nolan's film, which is that Dunkirk is remembered as this big victory, this uplifting thing, this this rescue. It was defeat, but also really a victory, and. I think the film really works to strip that away and be like, yes, there were heroic elements at Dunkirk, but a lot of it's just a bunch of kids trying to survive. Yeah. You know, there's not a lot of like, you know, to, to sort of wrap it in this notion of heroism. I mean, from the very first scene, uh, Fionn Whithead, uh, Whitehead's character, uh, he is like running for his life and he is the only one who survives because he's lucky. Like, and that's all it is. And he was just trying to take a poop. He's just trying to take a poop and he got <laughs> shot at. And then all of the, everyone he was with got shot and t- killed and he jumped over a fence and lived, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, and like that's, and that's to me. And then, so by the time you get to the end of the film where you're, you know, he's flatly reading Churchill's statement, it doesn't ring true to his experience, yeah. but it's the truth that the masses need in order to keep the war effort going. Yeah. And I think, again, I think it's it's different experiences because I do think Tom Hardy's pilot is that heroic person. Mm-hmm. Like he is willing to lay down his life for yes. um, saving others. And, you know, same with Mark Rylance to some degree, his character, uh, you know, driving his tugboat. And just, just this notion that all of these men got together and got on their boats and just ship did what they but, could. The, but also the notion that like, oh, well, everyone here is a hero. And it's like, no, sometimes you're you're a shitty Harry Styles guy who's yeah. who wants to be or or you're or you're uh Killian Murphy who's like, nope, we got it, you know, I'm shell shocked and yeah, we're not going back. Yeah. You know, this this notion that you have to be um heroic is not I think the film, even though it's experiential, it's trying to sort of find the levels and the shades of gray in these experiences. Yeah, for sure. So, so that's the filmography of Christopher Nolan. I've gone long on all 10 films on Collider. So, uh, you know, check out those essays if, if you're so inclined. Um, and now his new film is Tenet, which I've seen and Adam hasn't <laughs> because they're not screening it for critics. I saw it at a screening. So for, for those who are like, well, how, how can you go see Tenet? And I don't get to go see Tenet. Like, if it's your life, but I wouldn't recommend it because I saw it in a theater with six people who were all invited critics and everyone was wearing a mask in a, and the theater had 180 seats. So if you can get that experience, you know. And nobody was munching on popcorn or. No one was munching on, on popcorn. We all saw it at like one in the afternoon, like in IMAX. Like it was very much just, you know, and I knew everyone in the theater for the most part. Um, you know, it was just, it, again, like if you can like rent a private theater to see Tenant, you know, do you, but. I would not recommend going to see Tenet as just a regular theater goer. Um, so tell me about Tenet. Uh, what, uh, no spoilers. We're not going into spoilers here. Mm-hmm. But it, it, what film of Nolan's is it closest to? Or is it close to any of them? It's closest to Dunkirk, I would say. Because, but not in a way that I would say is complimentary. Because Dunkirk doesn't really have characters and neither does Tenet. Um, but in Dunkirk, that's the point. And in Tenet, that's not the point. <laughs> yeah. And in, in Tenet, it's like J- he's trying to make a James Bond film. That's what it's very much like. I wanted to make a Bond film, but I wanted to make it in the way with with elements that interest me yeah, or interest Christopher Nolan. Um, and I feel like 
he sort of it, it and so like yeah it has the action and bombast of a bond movie like speedboats and you know car chases and gunfights and like he's a spy getting information but it's a lot of just like you know, John David Washington like goes to get this doodad and then he has to go get that doodad and then he has to go get that doodad. And it's just like, brr, like it doesn't, I've, and I say this as someone who earlier this year watched all 24 Bond movies <laughs> and we will have that podcast later. We will yes. do that podcast. November. Uh, November. When no time to die comes out, we will talk Bond at length. Um, oof. oof. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be fun. It will be fun. But the thing is, is that like Tenet is doesn't, it's more concerned, like Dunkirk is obsessed with time as well. Like it, it lays out like one week, one day, one hour. Like it's, you know, how time functions and how the time intersects, but it's experiential. Tenet is obsessed with this notion of, of that it's invented called time inversion and everything revolves around time inversion. And by the end of the film, you're like, I don't give a shit about time inversion. <laughs> I don't care. I don't. And it's just, and that's the thing. Like you, you spend so much of the film. I mean, like, wait, what is happening? What's going on? Okay. I'm just going to go along for the ride, but you don't really care about the ride because you don't care about the characters. So that's my feeling about tenant. It's that it's a kind of like a bad version of Dunkirk in a way. How is the craft mixed? So there are set pieces that are really good. There are set pieces that are like very, you know, Hoyt Van den Hoytema, who's been his um, cinematographer since Interstellar. You know, he he knows how to wield that IMAX camera. I'll tell you that. Um, and you know, you really get the scope and 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 uh, of it. But there are other times where it's like the action kind of falls flat out. Like by the time you get to the climactic set piece, and I was just like, I was tuned out, man. I was just like, I don't care. I don't care what's mm -hmm. like, and they, there's this whole scene where they explain what exactly is happening in the set piece. And I was like, I don't care because I don't care about these characters. And it kind of reminded me of a, like a Michael Bay Transformers movie where oh, it's wow. just like, yeah, because it's like, okay, here's a lot of explosions. Here's a lot of chaos. Here's a lot of bombast. This clearly cost a lot of money, but I don't care. And it's just the only difference is, is that these characters are in finely tailored suits and Michael Bay movies have like pissing robots. Like it doesn't, real like it's the tone is different but the the mistakes are the same and so and then when you get into like i think i actually didn't i thought uh Ludwig Göransson's score was was pretty good but the sound mix nolan has had a, like he doesn't like to do adr and that's a problem in a movie where characters spend a lot of their time explaining what's happening and you can either be like this exposition matters or you're just supposed to have the experience but you can't kind of have it both ways. And so it's a movie where you're f frequently frustrated. You're like, wait, what are they saying? What did I miss? And it's covered up by sound effects. And it's like, well, either I'm supposed to understand this or I'm not. And if I'm not, and if I'm just supposed to feel it and just go along with it, that's fine. But then you're sort of shooting yourself in the foot by asking your audience to understand this complicated time inversion thing. Can't wait to see Tenet. <laughs> I do want to see it in an IMAX theater. I do hope that, you know, I don't know. If I mean, I'm betting they'll re-release it. It's supposed to, it's only supposed to make like 20 million this weekend or something. Yeah. Like it's not, not what Warner brothers counted on. So I expect they'll re-release it. Yeah. Um, but I, I gotta say, like, I think a lot of people are going to be disappointed, especially the way it's positioned itself to be like the savior of cinema. Um, I, I think a lot of people are going to go and they're, even if you're like a Nolan diehard, you're going to be like, wait, what is happening? Yeah. Why should I care? Because at the end of the day, like Nolan movies still have characters you care about. Like yeah. Interstellar is like, they talk about time dilation and time is a resource and, you know, gravitational forces and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's about a father and daughter and you can get that. And there's emotional, there's emotional stakes to that, that you feel. And I just felt enough, almost nothing watching uh, tenant. There's a little bit of emotional stakes with Elizabeth Debicki's character, but that's very small. Um, and like, you know, Robert Pattinson seems to be having a good time. John David Washington's a cool cat. You know, I wish he was in a better movie than this. Um, I just found tenant immensely disappointing. That's a shame. <laughs> yeah. And I won't go on beyond that because sure. I don't, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but I do. I just, I, um, like halfway through, I was like, man, this is not good. <laughs> this is not. And I can t and I know it's not going to get better. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. 
Um, so yeah, we'll talk ten in another time once after you see it. But yeah, we'll do a spoiler podcast at some point. Yeah, we'll probably dive into that. Um, all right. Well, with that, uh, this has been a very long episode. Let's move into recently watched. What have you seen lately? Um, well, not super recent, but because it's now out on Peacock, I wanted to talk about AP Bio, mm -hmm. which is a show that I did not watch when it was on NBC. It's a comedy. Um, season three just premiered on Peacock on Friday, September 4th, and it's just so good and so funny and so joyous. Uh, it's created by Mike O'Brien, who was on SNL, um, who did that famous uh, that Halloween sketch with the Halloween costume or like the monsters literal monsters i think um that was like a digital short kind of deal um but essentially it's glenn howerton is this kind of like harvard philosophy professor who ends up in toledo teaching a high school ap biology class just you know he, he just got the gig he doesn't want to be there um and he's a dick like he does not care about these kids or these students and like from the pilot on like he tells the students he's not going to teach them AP bio. He's going to use, they have to help him figure out ways to exact revenge against his nemesis. Like that is what he's using the class for. And it does not waver from that three seasons in, he is still not teaching biology. And the fun of it is that the kids kind of get into it. And like, it doesn't become a show where he like grows to love the kids or keep them like from bullying, but like his admiration for the kids comes in like the increasingly dangerous ideas they come up with. Like he's very impressed but also genuinely cares about them. And Patton Oswalt plays the principal and he's just very like very nice guy and doesn't want to ruffle feathers. And so that's how he kind of gets away with everything. Paula Pell is the principal secretary and is just like a brilliant physical comedian and just like every single delivery line delivery she gives is incredible. What really sets the show apart are a couple of things. The cinematography is really striking. Um, it feels cinematic, um, but also like, in a show like this, there's usually like some performances that are so so or some people who don't really hit the jokes. But like every one of the kids, every one of the supporting cast members is hilarious. And the joke deliveries are really quick witted and really fast. Um, and they, they do enough of like empathy building with the character, the lead character to make him not just like a, an absolute prick who you want nothing to do with. Uh, you kind of care about him and the kids. But uh, man, it's so funny. Uh, all three seasons are on Peacock right now. And I I highly suggest checking it out. It was it was kind of like a balm for me during this time because it was just a really joyous half hour comedy that's just really funny and a little bit sweet, but mostly just kind of edgy and, and naughty. So it's a good one. Good. I, I'll check it out. I mean, I have Peacock, so I'll, I'll yeah. check it out. Um, I'm going to do a 180 in tone from where you, <laughs> you are. Uh, I watched on Stars the documentary Emmanuel, which is about the Eman the Emmanuel church shooting in, in – uh, South Carolina. Um, and it's, it's, it's not an easy watch by any stretch. It's not a long film. It's only about 80 minutes, but the director, they get into, you know, they talk to the family members of, of those who, who lost or, you know, people, people that were murdered at uh, Christ Emmanuel church. Um, and I think it's Christ Emmanuel. Um, but it's, it's a powerful film because what it sort of reframes it into is obviously it, it doesn't ignore the racial aspect of these, you know, it was, you know, the killer, uh, it was a hate crime. He was motivated by racism. Um, but what makes the film really fascinating is the religion of the people, you know, um, and of, of the, the families and sort of what they're about and trying to reconcile if your religion instructs you to forgive, you know, if, if Jesus's final words are forgive them, father, they know not what they do. What does that demand of you as a Christian and watching the film wrestle with that is really fascinating and very powerful because, um, you know, sometimes people see forgiveness as, uh, as a it, as a way to circumvent change, if if it's just about forgiveness, then you know what what then have we removed all consequence? Um, and it's just it asks some very tough questions that it doesn't have an answer to. And it's I mean it is an emotionally devastating film. I mean you're talking to these families about the last time they saw their loved ones, but it never feels exploitative. Um, and I just I feel like it's a story that needs to be told uh, and certainly not forgotten. And I think it's certainly in America, it's easy to forget mass shootings because there are so many of them. Um, 
but I feel like this is it, 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 it kind of hit me in the same way that uh, the documentary Newtown hit me of just like having to sit with these families and understand sort of the framework of their grief and and sort of the lasting power of it but sort of you know how do they move forward you know what do their lives look like um and i don't and i think it's hard to do that without being exploitative as well but i think that the direction here and as, and also in newtown it's not exploitative it's very compassionate and uh it makes for a powerful documentary so if you have stars uh i would i would highly recommend checking out emmanuel obviously steal yourself for it but um it's it's a powerful documentary yeah i know that's one i need to check out um okay Whew. i was i i didn't mean to end on that note but yeah some, sometimes that's how it goes um yeah so uh thank you all for listening to this very long podcast um and if you want to keep up with us you should follow us on twitter adam where can people find you on twitter at adam chitwood you can find me at Matt Goldberg. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll be back with you next week.